and we'll start with a question from Dr. Ravelay. Okay, well, is this, am I, can you hear me? Okay. Not yet. No. Um, oh, we may have a problem. No, I didn't do it. <laughs> I swear I didn't know. I think you're, it's on now. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I just need to speak louder. I'm, um, I'm so honored to be sitting <laughs> next to a Nobel laureate that I, I can't even think straight. Um, <laughs> um, one of the issues that I'll bring up in my talk is the other footprint that we have, which is the nitrogen footprint that goes along with the carbon footprint. And I wonder if the uh, IPCC has thought about nutrient cycles as much as they've thought about carbon cycles. Well, actually, we deal with all the so-called Kyoto greenhouse gases. There are six of them. And this time around, we're also going to look at black carbon. So we certainly include an entire package of these greenhouse gases, and we convert them into CO2 equivalent in looking at the levels of reduction or levels of increase that one is dealing with. So uh, it's entirely true that uh, we do include all these major gases. And certainly, if you look at uh, the use of nitrogen in a whole range of compounds that are used in human activities, there is a major implication in terms of emissions of nitrogen, nitrogenous gases as well, which uh, have major implications for climate change. Thank you. Professor Rasmussen. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pachari. I think when most people think of climate change, they think of CO2 emissions and energy. I understand the next IPC <coughs> report will focus on water. Is that, is that right? And I, I, what I would like to hear, you've brilliantly laid out the impacts of uh, climate change and on, on water and the consequences. I'd like to hear a little bit about why the hydrologic cycle and the science of the hydrologic cycle is so vital to understand, because I think most people think energy and energy sources. Well, I think energy is important in respect of mitigation of the emissions of greenhouse gases. So we, when we're discussing mitigation measures, we necessarily have to look at how we can bring about a major transition in the production and use of energy. But when we look at impact, certainly wet water is an extremely important part of the diverse impacts of climate change. And in the fourth assessment report itself, we did place a lot of emphasis on water. As a matter of fact, we brought out a separate document on climate change and water. This is what we call a technical paper. It's a fairly voluminous document which is available on the IPCC website. And I would uh, encourage those who are interested to refer to it. Now, in the fifth assessment report, water is again something that we have included as a cross-cutting theme. And I think we'll use all the new knowledge that's available on the subject to see what's going to happen to the hydrological cycle on the planet as a result of climate change. Uh, so, is it safe to say that that water is the chief, I mean, water is the chief vector of climate change? Well, water certainly is, but there are also uh, other impacts, as uh, I indicated, you know, for instance, I didn't spend too much time talking about the degradation of soil, but that degradation is also associated with reduction of moisture in the soil. So water clearly, including the problem of sea level rise, is you're absolutely right, uh, the critical impact of climate change, which we have to understand. And the rising of the sea levels and the melting of the bodies of ice and the thermal expansion of the oceans is very much a part of the entire hydrological cycle on the planet. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sedlak? Uh, Dr. Pachari, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, one of the things that I, I find fascinating about the IPCC's work is the ability to project something a hundred years in the future, because I have a hard time figuring out what I'm going to do next week. Um, and, and one of the things that I, I, I imagine about the predictions that you're making is that there's a feedback between 
climate change and the rate of migration to cities and also GDP. So could you tell us something about the feedbacks that are implicit in some of those assumptions or how much climate change is likely to uh, speed the rate of migration to the cities and also decrease the GDP of the people who live there or the quality of life? Yeah, firstly on the comment that you made about projecting uh, uh, 100 years into the future, uh, Tom Friedman, uh, the journalist who's a good friend and, you know, recently we were, we were together at two uh, events and uh, he also highlighted this problem, you know, typically uh, people have this reaction that, you know, I'm not going to be able to help climate change, uh, there's nothing that I can do and in any case if it's going to happen a hundred years from now, let's just go out and party right now. Okay. <laughs> Now, um, that, that's one way of looking at it, but on the other hand, I think as rational creatures, generally rational creatures, um, we are concerned about the future of the human race, we are concerned about our children and their grandchildren, and therefore, I would say today, even among the leadership of the most important countries in the world, there is a realization that we've got to bring about uh, major changes and that's precisely why the G8 has set a, set a target of reduction of greenhouse gases by 80% up to 2050. Of course, none of the leaders who've expressed that desire will probably be around in 2050, but at least they're giving society a direction, which is a good thing. Um, and therefore, I would say that um, uh, we, we have to look at the future, we have to look at the cumulative impacts of, of climate change and how these will affect the very stability of everything on the planet. Um, on the issue of um, what one can do about it, I think um, we, we have to make sure that we adapt to the impacts of climate change. Because even if we bring about a reduction of emissions to zero levels today, the inertia in the system will continue with climate change for several decades. And therefore, we'll have uh, no choice but to ensure that we adapt to that level of climate change. The second question that you asked about migration levels, this again will vary from place to place. Uh, if you look at uh, the problem in North Africa, for instance, they're going to suffer from major reductions in availability of water, so also the Mediterranean region. And it's no coincidence that you have so many people trying to go across the Mediterranean into Europe illegally um, because they would look for areas where they can get at least uh, means by which they can keep body and soul together. So uh, I think there would be enormous variation across the globe in terms of the threat of migration. What is particularly worrisome is the fact that if we were to get sea level rise of even a meter or more, and it could be very much more if the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets were to collapse, then we would have possibly hundreds of millions of uh, climate refugees. And they would go all over because, you know, uh, they may not be able to uh, find accommodation in their neighborhood. So I think uh, this is an issue which needs a great deal of research, some of it perhaps speculative research, but we've got to develop scenarios of the future by which people can understand the seriousness of the problem and what we might have to confront. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Graff. Yes, I think that what you see here uh, in front of the audience is a group of scientists by and large. And we probably agree that adaptation to these problems is the logical solution. We tend to think on time periods of 10 years, 50 years, a century. Unfortunately, uh, the actuation of adaptation is partly political. How do you see us uh, as researchers and concerned citizens interacting with political leaders who must operate on an election cycle of two to four years? Well, frankly, I'm not dismayed by this prospect. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the political leaders are only worried about the next election in any democracy. And it was Churchill who said, democracy is the worst form of government except all the others. Because, 
because, uh, I mean, there are imperfections in democracy, but certainly much less than you have in other forms of government. Uh, I think what really would make a difference is to create public awareness. And we've seen two or three recent examples of political change coming about uh, as a result of climate change becoming an important issue in the elections. Australia, you had John Howard, someone who had done extremely well for the Australian economy, was voted out. And Kevin Rudd was brought in because he said he'll ratify the Kyoto Protocol, protocol the very first week that he gets office, and he did. So a country like Australia, which is prosperous, doing very well in terms of uh, economic growth, uh, saw the impacts of climate change. They've had prolonged droughts in the Murray-Darling Basin, which is really the granary of Australia. And this became a major political issue. Uh, we've recently had a change in government in Japan. And I met the Prime Minister of Japan on two occasions in the last one month. Once in Japan, in Tokyo, before he had taken office. And he said, I'm committed to this reduction of 25% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2020 over 1990 levels. And he repeated that in the UN just 11, 12 days ago. Uh, so I think uh, if the populace understands uh, the seriousness of the problem, and therein lies the need for scientists to reach out and inform the public, then this could become an election issue. I think to some extent, you look at President Obama's election. Of course, he didn't talk too much about climate change during his campaign, but his position was well known. <clears throat> and I think he's got support, and I think young people in particular, because their futures are at stake. I think they are the ones who have to be mobilized. And I'd like to, as I mentioned in my tag, talk, I'd like to find uh, the young guy who got his dad to reduce the, the shower time that he was, uh, he was uh, addicted to. So I think there, there, there is reason for hope that this could also become politically potent as a force for change. Professor Biswas, uh, question. One comment and a question. First, let me congratulate you for a very good lecture. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. The comment is, in the West, generally, it is assumed that the migration is from the developing countries to the Western countries. But in reality, it's much more of a global problem. We now see, for example, in the US, people might be concerned illegal immigration from Mexico to US, but Mexico has a major problem, illegal immigration from Central America to Mexico. In India, we have major problem in terms of immigration from Bangladesh, illegal immigration from Bangladesh, Nepal, etc. In South Africa, the same. Brazil, the same. So I just wanted to clarify that it's a global problem and uh, people are moving from one part to another and not only from only developed, developing country to developed country. Developing countries themselves sure. also have this problem. So that's just a comment. The question I would like to ask is, with your extensive knowledge of science, technology, and background with the political leaders. If you look forward, not 100 years from now, 20 years from now, what would be your realistic estimate, what type of situation you will see in terms of climate change mitigations in the next, in, let's say in 2030? So what will be your personal opinion? I'm not asking you as an IPCC chairman, but your personal opinion the realistic what we might be able to see. Not an optimistic one, not a pessimistic one, but a realistic one. Well, to be quite honest, I'm deeply worried mm -hmm. because uh, the extent and the seriousness, seriousness of extreme events is going to grow to a level where you would probably see disasters in several parts of the world. And it's difficult to define uh, the word uh, disaster, but Certainly, there would be enormous human suffering, enormous loss of property, and therefore, a direct impact on the stability of society in several parts of the world. And my hope is that this realization will get the world to act rather quickly and start reducing emissions of greenhouse gases with a sense of urgency. And if we were to do that, 
then certainly over the next 20 or 30 years there will be climate change, but it hopefully will not reach levels that are going to be totally disruptive of several societies across the globe. So, I've said this before, the next two or three years are going to be crucial to what's going to define the future. And if we miss action in the next two or three years, or a clear plan for taking action, then my fear is that we are in trouble. And I think this is something that the world has to understand. One doesn't want to be a scaremonger, but at the same time, you've got to be a realist. The evidence is mounting, the scientific uh, assessment is very clear, and I don't think we can shut our eyes to this reality. Okay, thank you. A question from the audience. Um, continued world population growth is the basic problem related to environmental energy and water issues. Why, therefore, do we not include population growth issues among strategies for solving these problems? Well, population certainly is a variable, but I always quote the example of uh, an event that we had organized in Washington, D.C. several years ago on population, environment, and development. And Senator Tim Worth uh, came to speak over there, and he said something which I thought was very interesting and profound. He said, we have a population problem in this country. We are adding about three million people to our population each year, and each American consumes 40 times what a Bangladeshi consumes. So we're really adding 120 million Bangladeshis to the planet each year right here in this country. Now, therefore, I think population is a serious problem, but we also have to look at consumption levels. Um, often, um, you find that people where populations are growing are living in a state of poverty, which also makes it very difficult for them to limit their fertility levels because, you know, traditionally poor people regard children as a resource. They provide labor, they provide inputs for producing goods and services, and the attitudinal and economic shift to having smaller families therefore doesn't come about. And as somebody said, the best contraceptive is really development. And there is no easy path to development, but I think if you look at what happened with the Marshall Plan in Europe, for instance, if we were to have some seriousness by which we treat the developing world, or the poorest regions of the developing world, as a target that needs help, then I think we can bring about a reduction in poverty, and that in itself will lead to a reduction in population growth rates. In the absence of that, I'm afraid populations will continue to grow unless you take draconian steps, like China's been able to do very successfully. Uh, the one-child family norm has worked in China, but will it work everywhere else? I'm not too sure. Okay, another question from the audience. Uh, please comment on irrigation practices and the risks associated with them. I think we need a lot of research on irrigation practices. And essentially, I think every single drop of water has to be utilized effectively. Uh, I'm afraid most agricultural institutions, including the global CGAIR system, has really not focused on agricultural practices or innovations by which we improve the efficiency of water use. And agriculture being the largest consumer of water in most societies, in some cases, between 80 to 90 percent, clearly should be the area of concentration. And I would say that this should become the major uh, focus of research in the international agricultural research system. Also the fact that we have to come up with means by which uh, the drought proneness of agriculture can be uh, taken care of. We have to find means by which agriculture can flourish under conditions of drought. That means we, we need to come up with species, we need to come up with practices that can allow crops to be grown with much lower quantities of inputs of water. So it's a huge area for research, demonstration, and dissemination of the right practices. Okay, thank you. 
Um, here's a question from the internet. Dr. Pachari, the global climate has been cooling in the past 10 years, yet the past decade has seen an increase in CO2 emissions. North America has just experienced one of its cooler summers. This has not pr been predicted in any computer model. Please explain. Well, the point is, look, the IPCC and anyone who's researching on climate change is not in the business of predicting weather. Weather prediction is totally distinct from changes in the climate. I mean, the weather will change. Just because you have one cool summer or one cool winter doesn't mean that climate change has gone away. I showed you the graph of temperature changes over the last 150 odd years. There are ups and downs in that weather. And you know, there are natural factors that bring about changes in the weather. But you know, you can't mistake the wood for the trees. The fact is that the climate is changing, and I'm not too sure where these temperatures have been measured by the person who's asked this question. Where are the 10 years of cooling that have been observed? I, I, I don't think it's on this planet. Maybe it's somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a question from the audience, but it's related. Um, how does an increase in surface temperature lead to increased variability in weather patterns? Well, as I told you, uh, changes in, uh, uh, in uh, warming and, of course, the whole influences that are bringing about warming of the Earth uh, are leading to a disruption of the climate system. Let's face it, nature has given us a very delicate balance in terms of all the movements of the winds, all the, the, the currents that take place in the oceans, uh, the temperatures that are maintained across the globe, uh, if you disrupt that, then clearly all of these factors will also change. You know, the Arctic, for instance, is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the planet. You can imagine what that's going to do to ocean currents, to the movements of wind, and of course, the, uh, the livelihood of species that live in that region. So I think what we're talking about is not merely an increase in temperature. What we're talking about is a complete disruption of a delicately balanced climate system. And that's what we have to be concerned about. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from the audience. Which are the top countries at greatest risk of becoming failed states due to climate change? Well, I deliberately wouldn't want to identify them because then the next time I visit any of those countries, I won't get a visa. <laughs> <laughs> and well before I apply for a visa, I might get lynched. <laughs> so, I mean, I have to worry about my own uh, well-being as well. But there are countries which uh, clearly fall in that category, I can assure you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's a question, there are a number of these on this vein. Uh, what could a high school student do right now to prevent climate change? Sorry, what could I? What could a high school student do right now? Oh, the future's in your hands. The globe is really resting in your palms. I think high school students can really define the future. You've got to do that through your own personal changes in your lifestyles, by influencing adults in your household, by perhaps forming groups in your communities, wherever you are, certainly on your campuses. I'm very happy to see that in a number of universities, there is now a serious effort to bring down uh, emissions of greenhouse gases and to monitor all the activities that would bring that about. So I urge you, I urge all high school students to set about this, because I, I believe that governments and nation states are not going to be the only actors that can bring about change. There's nothing more powerful than grassroots level action. And I think high school students can be at the vanguard of that. So you have my best wishes and blessings. Thank you. Another question from the audience. What three books would you suggest the decision leaders read on this topic of global warming? Well, I would say please read the IPCC fourth assessment report, <laughs> at least the synthesis report. Don't read the, I, I mean, if you can read them, read the uh, working group volumes, which we call the BRICS, because each one of them is about a thousand pages 
long. So you might get lost reading those. Read the synthesis report, which is e readable, which is easy. Uh, there are enough diagrams over there. Do read that. I would also strongly recommend, if you're so inclined, my institute has just brought out a book on Gandhi's sayings and his philosophy. He was the ultimate ecologist. He was ahead of his time. We actually published a book on his sayings, and I can rattle off 20 of them right now, but I don't want to use this occasion for that purpose. But we brought out a book in the 80s. Dr. Khushu was the one who wrote it. Uh, and it sold, it sold out several editions of it. Now we have brought out a larger uh, version of it, going into his thinking, his philosophy. Please do read that. And I would say, read your religious scriptures. There is not one single religion in the world that doesn't tell you how important it is to have reverence for nature. And just try to interpret what the leaders of specific religions have told us, irrespective of what faith you belong to. And you know, that gives you enough reading material, the three that I've just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I have another question from the internet audience. Um, how much water would be saved if people were to cut down on the amount of red meat they eat? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the figures uh, available with me, but uh, if you send me an email, I'll send you, well, uh, you, you, if you go to uh, my website, the address of which I never remember, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you would find the data on this. But, uh, red meat is extremely intensive in the use of water. If somebody sends me an email, I promise you I'll respond. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's a, there's another question here that's very similar, and I think well, I was going to save it for the end, but we'll do it now. Um, could Dr. Pachari make his PowerPoint and movie available on the conference website? It would be a great uh, resource for teachers. And I th it's available. I mean, I would be happy to, for anyone to uh, refer to it, and it's in the public domain, and uh, I'd request, request the college to uh, put it on its website if they want to. Okay, thank you. We also, um, as you may know, we have, um, besides web streaming this live, we're also uh, recording this conference, so uh, teachers can make use of that um, as a resource as well. Okay, um, here's another tech, more technical question. What is the what is the place for atmospheric uh, CO2 scrubbers or CO2 sequestration? Well, you know, uh, not enough has been done on carbon capture and storage or carbon sequestration and storage. Uh, the IPCC brought out a special report on the subject about five years ago. And we clearly brought out the potential and the problems of this technology on which we essentially said that much more work needs to be done. And I've been talking to several companies like Stat Oil Hydro in Norway, that's been a pioneer in this area, to spend much more time, effort, and resources to develop carbon capture and storage. It's sad that in the last administration, uh, they started a, a project essentially to capture CO2 from coal-based power stations and to store it and sequester it. And that was given up even before they could get anywhere. I think we need enormous research and development. And we also need to secure uh, whatever carbon is going to be captured and s stored in such a way that there are no leakages, that it doesn't escape. And to create that level of confidence will take an enormous amount of research, development, demonstration, and monitoring of specific projects. So we're still not there. We have a way to go. OK, thank you. I have one more question from the audience. Um, how significant is the upcoming Copenhagen Conference on Climate Change? And how critical is U the US, China, India's participation? Well, the Copenhagen Conference is extremely important. There are huge expectations worldwide that we would reach agreement that essentially will move the world towards solving this problem in an effective and meaningful way. Um, it's very difficult to predict what's going to be the outcome of that conference, but my belief is that with the extent of awareness that exists, with the kind of will that exists at the level of the leadership in several parts of the world, we will get it 
get an agreement. But may I also emphasize that Copenhagen, in some sense, is a start of a movement, a start of a transition that's not going to stop over there. It may actually set in motion several actions that would really lead us to a more sustainable pattern of development. Because that's the larger problem. Climate change is essentially the breakdown of a system of development that would be sustainable. Our system of development is not sustainable. And I would hope that Copenhagen will be a trigger, will be a starting point for moving us in that direction. Okay.